The epithet Lucifer is translated from the Hebrew Halil, Shining One or Ben Sacher, Day Star, Bringer of Light, or the Son of the Morning. It is interesting to note that Jesus was also called Lucifer in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 and Revelation chapter 22 verse 16. So if Lucifer is the devil's name, then one would have to admit that Jesus is the devil. It serves as a somewhat humorous yet fortuitous irony that more people have been killed and been killed in Jesus or Lucifer's name than almost any other name in history. Another name for the devil within the Judeo-Christian belief system is Beelzebub. The word Beelzebub stems from the Hebrew Baalzebub. In English, Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies and it is the first part of this name which is of interest to scholars of comparative mythology. The name Baal, which could be etymologically rooted in the name of the ancient Babylonian sun god, Bel. Yet in its present form, Baal represents the later Phoenician and Canaanite god, Baal, who guest stars in the Hebrew holy books on numerous occasions. Baal was incorporated into the Hebrew language and came to have a variety of meanings including Lord, Master, Husband, and Possessor. The conflicting characterizations attributed to the devil within the religious literature of the Jews along with the verse found in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 7, God alone is responsible for good and evil, seems to indicate that the devil has been a relatively more recent interpolation by Jewish mythographers who grafted him into the existing scriptures, thereby creating a situation in which this fictitious character has been ascribed multiple names and titles. Further, as mentioned, the very form or being of the devil has been the subject of much confusion. Many Christians and Jews try to suggest that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was the devil, but the description of the serpent contradicts this notion. Once again, the HarperCollins Bible Dictionary informs us that it should be noted that the serpent of Genesis 3 is never in the Old Testament identified as Satan. The serpent is described as one of the beasts of the field. After tempting Eve to eat the forbidden, ethics-infused fruit from the tree of knowledge, the serpent is punished by God in the following manner. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. One does not have to be a theologian to understand what the author was talking about in this passage. The serpent was a cunning beast of the field, who prior to his indiscretion had legs and spoke. This alleged description of the devil as being a beast of the field contradicts the portrayal of him given in the book of Job, in which he, Satan is counted amongst the Son of God. Regarding Satan's role in the book of Job, the HarperCollins Bible Dictionary says, In the first two instances, Satan is depicted as a member of God's court whose basic duty it was to accuse human beings before God. He is clearly not at this point an enemy of God and a leader of the demonic forces of evil as he becomes later. The motif of the serpent tempting the female of the first primordial couple can also be traced to the more ancient Persian mythology. On this matter, T.W. Doan says, To continue the Persian legend, we will now show that according to it, after the creation man was tempted and fell. Kolish and Bishop Kalinso tell us the Persian legend that the first couple lived originally in purity and innocence. Perpetual happiness was promised them by the Creator if they preserved in their virtue. But an evil demon came to them in the form of a serpent sent by Araman, the prince of devils, and gave them fruit of a wonderful tree, which imparted immorality. Evil inclinations then entered their hearts, and all their moral excellence was destroyed. Consequently, they fell and forfeited the eternal happiness for which they were destined. They killed beasts and clothed themselves in their skins. In addition, Sunderland supports the Persian origin of the devil, saying, Even if we admit that the serpent in the Genesis Paradise story ought to be identified with Satan, we have here no exception, for it should be borne in mind that the book of Genesis was probably not completed before about the beginning of the 5th century before Christ, a century after the captivity closed. Belief in the existence of such a bad being, the foe of God, the accuser of the good, the tempter of men to evil, 
seems to have come into Judaism from the religion of the Persians through contact with that people during or after the exile. Sunderland adds to the weight of this argument by highlighting the discrepancy between the accounts of David being tempted to take the census given to 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. Within both books, David is tempted to take census of his people. The only difference is that in 2 Samuel, it is God who tempts him to do so, and in 1 Chronicles, it is Satan. Sunderland remarks, in the appearance of this new belief, we find an instructive explanation of that strange contradiction which appears between the two accounts of the numbering of Israel, found in the books of Samuel and Chronicles. The record in Samuel tells us that it was the Lord who tempted David to do the numbering, that in Chronicles says it was Satan. The explanation is evidently this. Samuel is the older book by two or three centuries. At the time, it was written the belief in such a being as Satan was unknown and evil, as well as good, was referred to God as his author. But by the time Chronicles was compiled, belief in Satan had come in, and he, not God, was now held to be the instigator of evil. Hence an event which in the earlier book was naturally ascribed to God, was now as naturally ascribed to Satan. The contradiction is irreconcilable until one realizes that the Jews properly adopted their devil from the Persians, and so evil acts which were once attributed to Yahweh were now being rewritten and passed off as the devil's handiwork. This theology discrepancy becomes explicable and the contradiction is exposed for what it probably is. A change in the theology of the Jews influenced by the dualistic Persian religion at the time of the Persians' conquest of Babylon in around 539 BCE. Thus, it is near certainty that Judaism inherited the devil from the Persian Zoroastrians and the Christians, in turn, inherited their devil from the Jews. Finally, there was a related concept that the Christians seemed to have directly inherited from the Persians, and this was the concept of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, as described in Zoroastrian texts, is literally called the Antimithras. Mithras being the sun god and the son of the supreme god of the Persians, Ahura Mazda. From the ancient Zoroastrian scriptures, we read, Backward flies the arrow which the Antimithras shoots, on account of the wealth of bad on poetic thoughts which the Antimithras performs. Even when he shoots it well, even when it reaches the body, even then does not harm him on account of the wealth of bad unpoetic thoughts which the Antimithras performs. In conclusion, what is the truth about the devil? Other than he doesn't exist and has been used as a kind of stick to enforce the gullible masses' mindless adherence to absurdity? The truth is, he is a rescripted mythological character adopted by the Jews of the Persian period passed on to Christians and fed into young and trusting minds as a boogeyman that will torture you if you dare not submit to the religion of Christianity. I will conclude with a passage from Thomas Paine inspired work, The Age of Reason. The Christian mythologists, after having confined Satan in a pit, were obliged to let him out again to bring out a sequel to the fable. He is then introduced into the Garden of Eden, into the shape of a snake or a serpent, and in that shape, he enters into a familiar conversation with Eve, who is in no way surprised to hear a snake talk. And the issue of this tete tete is that he persuades her to eat an apple, and the eating of that apple damns all mankind. One will have to suppose that the church mythologists would have been kind enough to send him back again to the pit, that they would have put a mountain upon him, for they say their faith can remove a mountain, or have put him under a mountain, as the former mythologists have done, to prevent his getting again among the women and doing more mischief. But instead of this, they leave him at large, without even obliging him to give his parole, the secret of which is, they cannot do without him. <laughs>